My guest joins me to discuss how he is addressing the challenges of communicating health information in a virtual digital world. You're listening to the PHEC podcast, episode 293. The field of public health is so broad, overlapping multiple industries. With epidemiology at the core of public health, there are an unlimited number of ways to target specific populations, health conditions, environmental issues, and causes that matter most to you. My name is Dr. Huntley, and I'm the host here on the Public Health Epidemiology Conversations podcast. I'm an epidemiologist, consultant, and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in healthcare and public health. On this podcast, my guests and I engage in conversations that demonstrate the importance of public health and epidemiology across a variety of industries, helping you think outside the box and inspire greater positive impact in communities around the world. Now, let's dive into the topic of this brand new episode. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me on this episode. This episode is part of a special sponsored series of episodes where you'll learn about the Tribal Epidemiology Centers, often referred to as tech, through my conversations with public health professionals working with the community at each of the centers. My guest on this episode is Alex Smith, who joins me from Oklahoma to discuss his career journey and the work that he's currently doing as the creative director of the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board in Oklahoma City, where he's worked for eight years. Alex's team produced the amazing video called What is a Tribal Epidemiology Center? a few years back. This video can be found on the homepage of the Tribal Epidemiology Center's website, which I encourage you to check out, and I'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. During our conversation, Alex shared his career journey by including some personal stories, which remind us of the very real side of the public health work that we do and the importance of having a heart-centered servant mentality. Let me formally introduce Alex now, and then I'll connect our conversation. Some of the most fulfilling memories in Alex's life come from the power to connect people through creative storytelling. What began as animated story flipbooks in grade school, Alex now uses in his professional career, utilizing a wide range of media and digital design platforms to help other organizations move their story and mission forward. In today's world, he believes the pressure to be digital has never been greater. His passion is to help leaders adopt approaches to develop their organization's talent and prepare for successful and continued digital transformation. From Alex's vantage point, stories have always and will always resonate with any audience, but he urges digital storytellers to gain insight into the digital ecosystems in which we are all communicating in. In support of his son, Nathan, his family, and the health and well-being for all caretakers of special needs children, Alex is continuing to apply creative storytelling for advocacy and community awareness projects. His son, Nathan, dubbed a hero since conquering epilepsy at the age of eight, is living with diagnosed autism, fueled by much faith in God, a supportive in-home family, and ample amounts of coffee. (laughs) Alex balances work and family life with a listen, learn, lead mentality. In this current role as a creative director for the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, Alex has been able to help lead the organization in establishing an online presence, brand, and voice as a premier tribal public health board. He has lent his creative support and digital expertise on multiple projects that highlight health programs and initiatives for a number of our tribal nations in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. Alex lives in Oklahoma City, and when he isn't advocating for caretakers or working on a project, he's spending quality time with his kids and fiance, reading a good book, watching a zombie movie, or practicing piano. Let's connect my conversation with Alex right now. Hi, Alex. How are you? I am good. Good to be here today. 
Uh, I'm looking forward to our chat. Welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you taking some time to meet with me and and to chat about your work. Let's start at the beginning. (laughs) Why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name's Alex Smith. I am an enrolled Sac and Fox Nation in Oklahoma and also a descendant of the tribes of Pawnee Nation and the Oto Missouri tribe here in Oklahoma. I actually grew up in Pawnee, which for those that don't know, has never been to Oklahoma. If you go to Stillwater Country and OU Country, those are kind of Bedlam rivals. So Stillwater's about 30 minutes from Pawnee, so that's the closest city from Pawnee, but little small town community that I grew up in and was fortunate enough to to have a pretty pretty decent normal childhood. Of course, looking back on it, there's a lot of things that helped helped me good and bad as it raised me up and that includes mentors, experiences. But yeah, and, and here I work with the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board as the creative director and slash communications, but I have been there going on eight years in this position. So I'm um, oversee the department. We have uh, two, let's see, three people in our department and a CDC field, tribal field rep who does our social media. But yeah, I've been been here for almost eight years and enjoyed it. And uh, it's it's been a pretty cool experience. Yeah. I like that title too, creative director. I have more questions for you about that. But before we get into kind of more about what you're doing currently, let's go back a little bit. I love to hear the journey to this point. So like, do you remember when you first became interested in or first learned about public health? Honestly, I I got hired on here at Southern Plains Tribal Health Board. And that was, I don't think it was the first time I, I heard tribal or public health the phrase public health, I have to really go back to my high school years. And I was talking to my my one of my family members, my cousin, and we was talking about one of the organizations that we had. It was a it's it was called a Northern Plains Indian Club in Pawnee and and basically it was, you know, just consisted of a lot of us natives that were in the Pawnee community and mostly Pawnee, but there were some other tribes in there. But there was a psychologist who came in that was hired in to come in after school to speak to our club then. And her name was Data Star, I believe. But she was a native. I think the first time we, we went to a counseling session, it wasn't called a counseling session at the time, but the director told us, hey, someone's coming in to talk to us. And and talked about native issues. And so she came in and I remember the first time, you know, it, she kind of made us feel uncomfortable because, you know, in a way that natives from, from our native family perspective, like it was, it was hard to communicate, much less be vulnerable. So she was pushing that vulnerability issue and it was very uncomfortable. So there was a lot of crickets at first. But I think as we got into the second, third, and fourth session where everybody started opening up, and that's where I first heard the term public health and tribal indigenous issues. And that was way back in, I'm going to date myself, that was back in 93, 92. But yeah, I think that's that was the first time I ever heard that term. And then it kind of came full circle when I got hired on here to be the creative director and to bring kind of a innovative style to this communications that that we needed here, especially in these days and as we live in a digital world. But I was hired on to push some of that forward and do it through a creative and innovative way. But that, yeah, that's that's some of my memories back then of when I first heard the, the term public health. I like that story a lot. And I also like how even as you describe, you know, retrospectively that that encounter with the psychologist, she kind of pushed and it was uncomfortable. And that was a challenge of communicating then. And here you are, fast forward to current role where you're the creative director slash communications director. That is a very interesting point back in the day that 
I would say had a some sort of a role in where you are now. Would you agree? Yeah, I think it definitely helped me look at how to communicate like it, it not only with my peers at the time, you know, my friends, because mm-hmm. I was I was kind of shy. I still am really, but you know, it's it's funny that I'm in the communications work because that that was kind of my biggest problem. Even going into college courses, the scariest courses, of course, was public speaking. And so back then, you know, it, my family really didn't. The dynamic of our our relationships and in, inside our home, well, you know, communication wasn't our strong point. You know, so and I, basically our apologies. But hey, do you want something from the store? That was our apologies. So, <laughs> so it, it helped me op- open my mind and kind of look at communication. And she gave me the courage, state of star. She gave me the courage to not only approach her about questions and curiosity about communications and public health, you know, what the issues are then, but she also opened my mind to like, hey, this, I know this is a complex thing for you and your family as far as being communicative and being able to talk to each other and being vulnerable, but that's what it's going to take to to move forward in some of the, the things that you're going through. And at the time, I kind of, she had to peel me back in, you know, little layers. I, I was an onion. So, and as she peeled more, more layers back, I got more vulnerable and I kind of liked the feeling and not the, not the feeling of being uncomfortable with or being comfortable with uncomfortable conversations, what I used to say, but uh, I love the feeling afterwards, you know, like the perspective, like you know, you're, you're learning more about yourself, even at a young age in your teens and you're learning about relationships and what dynamic those make of and, and how to approach other relationships within your family. So that kind of started my journey of like this complex issue and I'm, I had to shell around me and being shy and, you know, wasn't really the type to use my voice or share my story. And it's funny, like fast forward to now, that's exactly what I do. And there are a lot of different advocacy efforts that are personal to me that I do that, you know, I share my story that that have helped me, you know, not only advance certain issues within our communities, but also things that we need as far as resources. So I can share more about that later. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to know more. Let's talk more about what you're currently doing. I really appreciate that story and, and you sharing even, you know, with us about your journey to this point. So I wonder if, if, if you have a way of connecting with her, what she would think about where you are now compared to if she even remembered, you know, some of the details, but we never know who we impact in our work. But tell me more about your role. You're currently what you do and as a creative director? So I think what a lot of this is what we're dealing with now is leadership in a virtual world and how we approach communications in a different way. And a lot of, I guess a lot of what I'm doing now is trying to make public health and epidemiology, those, those complex things that are, that are part of our makeup and what, what we do as an organization what we do as a staff and what our role is in our communities as far as helping our tribes. That's, it's such a complex ecosystem that we're in for health services, for tribal nations. And we're just one part of that whole ecosystem. So it's right now we're, we're really trying to break it down to be more understandable and, and put forth some kind of understandable educational materials, videos, you know, we're looking at podcasts, we're looking at different ways that we can stay connected to our communities. And that's, I think that's a lot of, a lot of the org- organizations that, you know, are in my work that we're, we're trying to do is, is to stay connected to, to each other, to, to our communities, to the people we serve. And that goes internally too. So there's a lot of internal things that, that we're working on to keep each other connected because as we're growing, I think just within a few years, we went from 20, 20 staff to 70 staff. So now that we're that large of an organization, you know, I think we're in the category of medium size now, but 
Some of us are working from home, teleworking. Some of us are hybrid, work from home and at work. Some of us are full, full-time full office. So there's a dynamic of that communication now that we're using anything we can to stay connected, whether, you know, whether that's tools and videos or even the dynamic of our meetings. We're trying to constantly change and adapt to to make sure that we know each other, like especially our new staff, you know, when they come in, you know, it's we want to make sure that everybody's kind of getting their due and, you know, and we're not just, you know, a title, you know, so, but I, for the most part, yes, that's, that's what we're doing is trying to put out educational materials. And as far as my department, really helping the programs thrive too. So I don't want to forget them. They'll, they'll, they'll get mad at me if I don't mention that. No, but making sure the programs thrive. And there's so many different issues that we hit on in the communities. And they're just, they're amazing. Our program managers are amazing. So we want to make sure that we're promoting and serving help, serving and strengthening our tribal nations as best we can. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Everything that you mentioned it calls for creativity and how we, we can't, there's no cookie cutter approach to how we communicate and the times are changing. People are different. The dynamic of our work environment, the communities, there's so many factors in it really in play. Even what worked three years ago doesn't work today. <laughs> what works today may not work three years from now. So we have to always be, re- you know, thinking about that and kind of on our toes. Could you take a moment and, and kind of describe the population that you serve through your tech and some of the communication challenges that that you've seen or that you're addressing. Yeah. So Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, we serve the 44 federally recognized American Indian tribes in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. We also reach out to urban Indian health centers in Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Wichita, and Dallas. But Southern Plains serves the largest Indian health service user population area in the United States. Um, but that's, that's, a, that covers a lot of area, a lot of communities and a lot of tribes. So I consider just like, like I said earlier, one, one of the goals is to, to make resources available and really promote the awareness of what exactly we do. So tribal tribal nations and tribal people know exactly where to get those resources. So partnerships is a big, big thing for us. So we partner with a lot of tribal nations in developing programs within their communities. So that's, that's an ongoing effort. I think I'd go back to that leadership in a virtual world. There is actually some of the things that I'm reaching out for as far as educational materials for myself and actually for my my department is how to put people first in a digital world. And so any thought leaders out there that authors that have books or training materials or conferences actually just participated in a, it's a communication director mentoring program. It's by Kivi LaRoe Miller. She actually runs a nonprofit that helps communication directors and nonprofits. But it was about six months and there was 12 of us. She only, she can only take 12 every six months. So there's 12 communication directors and we just meet virtually. And some of them are from nonprofits. Some of them are from universities, small companies, medium-sized companies. I think I was the only one in my group that had public health background, but in those meetings, we just shared resources and tips and things that we learned through our own experiences, through our own work. So we shared a lot of that stuff online and some of the resources that we can use and share with each other. We had mentoring side groups, you know, so I I linked up with other members of that group in LinkedIn and we shared resources there. So it helped me kind of develop things from their own perspective and vice versa that, you know, I let them know about some of the things I'm going through with our staff as far as making sure that we stay connected. And I know that social media is a, is a big thing now, you know, as it has been for a while, but 
pre-pandemic and post-pandemic communication is starkly different. It's very different. You know, it's so pre-pandemic, we maintained connections typically in person. And then post-pandemic, it was it was pretty much all virtual. We had to respond and adapt to a lot of different things that we didn't know about. So there was some things that we had to implement within our organization to make sure that we're we're staying connected. The work is moving forward. And in regards to social media, they always call them like connection platforms, but I don't believe they're connection platforms. They're communicating platforms. Connection really requires something far more complex. And I think connection in regards to relationships, that's really key is to make sure that we're staying connected on a human level so that social media, as you as you know, you know, it could be a very volatile at times, you know, because in communicating with people online, it's it could be somewhat bullying. There's there's been times that my own family has reported things on online that has affected them mentally. So there's just a thing about social media that, you know, there's just about likes and hearts and all these things that are that are not really part of connection. So it's just a we're trying to make sure that we're staying connected and trying to make sure that relationship as the is the core goal for the reason of adapting to these things in our lives. Yeah. Well said. I think that it is interesting all of the I wrote down here just taking a lot of notes as you were talking, but communication in a virtual slash digital world as being kind of the, that main challenge. And I think that's something that we need to, to just keep it top of mind, constantly reviewing what's working, what's not working and so forth. You also created a very special project that I want to talk about a little bit. You created a video that's on the website. I think it's on the main tribal epidemiology center's website it's called What is a Tech, which tech stands for Tribal Epidemiology Center. So can you tell me about that project? Like, really curious to know what inspired you to start this and how well were your ideas received? Tell us about that process. Yeah. So Kristen Mitchell, of course, you, you know Kristen. She approached us a few years back about doing this project for What is a Tribal Epidemiology Center and it goes back to that point I was making earlier about health boards. You know, there's, there's such a complex health ecosystem that we're in. So for tribes that don't know what public health is, how are they going to know what epidemiology is? How are they going to know that, to use these resources that tribal epi centers offer to them? So that's where the idea came from is making sure that we provide or, or do something with a media project that really just brought awareness to epicenters and the resources that they can offer tribal communities. As you know, there's, of course, 12 tribal epicenters across the nation. We're, we're one that serves Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. So we wanted to make sure that we was talking to all the leadership across those 12 TECs and just kind of get their perspective, their stories, their experiences, how they approached work and how they did things within their own tribal epicenter with their communities. And I think there was a lot of words like resources and relationships that were mentioned in that video, how important those were with the communities because our tribal communities, our tribal nations, they they pretty much hold their own stories. So we're just trying to push that story forward in a healthier way. So Abigail Alcahawk was one of them. And she was she was one of the first ones that we reached out to because of the data that was kind of her area of expertise, if you will, when she was talking about data. So that has been part of our story for a while. So to to reach out to her and to make sure that we got her voice as part of this project was very important to us. So. And then there was a few others. There's too many to name, but so much story, so many different things and that were shared during that project. We, we really had fun and going to Alaska was, you know, just a bonus for us and got to experience a little 
cooler weather and the mountains around us. So it was, it was pretty fun for us. I'll make sure that we provide a link to that video. It's on the website, but we'll we'll link it in the show notes so that our listeners in this episode can visit the website and see that video. I thought it was just a great example of creativity and really bringing to life the collaborative stories that represent the the 12 individual texts that all come together. So I personally like it and I encourage people to check it out. How long did it take you to? I would say about nine months from beginning to end. So pre-production, production, production and post-production, I I would say about nine, 10 months. Yeah. And so we wanted to make sure that we was hitting all the right communities. I think ideally we would have loved to travel and go to these other health boards and TECs across the nation. Of course, within the time range, you're, you're always dealing with funding. So the funding part is, you know, we wanted to make sure that we hit an event where all the TEC directors or all the program managers or people that were part of these other TECs and health boards were going to be at the same area. So that's why we chose Alaska. So they all came up to Alaska and we was able to set up an interview place for that area. So it, it worked out. But in hindsight, we always want to make the, the best product and hit the goal of the, the piece that we was doing. So I think we hit that goal as far as the project itself. But like I said, ideally, we would have loved to talk to more people. It just didn't work out like that. Uh, that, I think you guys did a great job. So I have a question for you that helps connect the dots for people. My audience of listeners of the podcast is, is very diverse. So people who are students, professionals, entrepreneurs, and anywhere in between, you know, could be listening. So really kind of connecting the dots with with epidemiology in an applied way, not looking for a textbook definition from you, but just in your own words, can you describe how epidemiology is important in the work that you do and the communities that you serve? Yeah. We first heard that word back in, what is this, 2023? So about 2015 and I think 94, that was around the time that TEC's epidemiology first came about as far as being funded and being part of the the health board system. But yeah, epidemiology, I think the the data would speak for for itself. You know, I think a part of me personally deals with the, the autism world. So I'm actually a dad to a 13 year old. My son has uh, diagnosed autism, so I deal a lot with the autism community here in Oklahoma, but also Autism Speaks. I have done a lot of advocacy work. I'm also part of a a strategic planning board with the Autism Foundation of Oklahoma. To have that, that kind of data on hand when you speak to policy boards or to speak to legislations to try to get policy change. One of the things that comes up in my memory as far as a, a story of how that data changed some things that were necessary in our community was that Medicare, Medicaid wasn't covering certain things when my son was younger as far as seizure medicine. I think he was having seizures at the time. I think that was he started having seizures around two years old, and the autism centers were not taking certain insurances, so Medicare wasn't being taken to cover those expenses for ABA therapy, which is which stands for Applied Behavior Analysis Therapy. So a lot of that uh, work we've done with Autism Speaks and people here in the community when we went and advocated on behalf of, you know, coverage, full coverage, or even some coverage, you know, really revolved around speaking some of those statistics and facts, you know, the the prevalence of autism, CDC reporting that approximately one in 44 children in the U.S. is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And that's 2018 data, but I know for me, the one that hits most was one in 27 boys identified with autism in that data and one in in 116 girls 
identified with autism. So boys were affected more and I always want to hit the head and the heart. So in my approach with trying to change that policy, when I was speaking to people on those policy boards and the Medicare and Medicaid reviewers, and also there were some people there from tribal nations and legislative representatives from Oklahoma. It was kind of a sobering experience because it really centered around my son's story. So when when I walked in there and, and I was given the floor to speak, I remember sitting around this round table and there was nothing but policy people and tribal nations and there was there was some people in there that were all about black and white, the people that they see as far as our statistics were concerned. They seen a piece of paper going across a desk and that's where I basically told my story. Like my son's name is Nathan. I wanted him to be here today. I really wanted to let you see of what what we go through. I was like, if we had coverage from Medicare, Medicaid to cover these behavioral expenses at an early age, we could be maybe communicating better or maybe having these professionals in behavioral work find those little puzzle pieces that fit, and which is why Autism Speaks uses those puzzle pieces and it, it really is, you know, autism is trying to find different puzzles. I actually did a another video called Chasing Hope that's sharing a bunch of our stories that, that were a part of a panel. That's what I told him. I was like, basically, I'm chasing hope. This is why I'm here. Your hope. And I don't want to talk to you as a policy board reviewer. I don't want to talk to you as a Medicare, Medicaid I don't want to talk to you under your titles. I want to talk to your heart as a parent, as someone who knows what it's like to raise kids without autism, without special needs. So you add that complexity of special needs and autism into the into the mix of your family, that changes the whole dynamic. And we've been having to learn as we go along as parents. So I've had to reach out and find resources myself. I've had to f- struggle with taking care of my son at night, you know, when he's struggling with seizures, when all I'm getting is denials, just trying to take care of my son with medicine. And I'm exhausted. And I really am reaching out to you to find a way to change this. And I told him about two stories from Nathan's point of view and what it's like to raise him. and. I think maybe two or three years down the line, that's when we started getting some traction as far as, you know, change. And I think about four years it took to finally, I got the email from one of our partners that said it, well, we did it full coverage. They, they just approved it. Autism or behavior ABA therapy is now covered as a fully covered. So that was a big win. It was, it was bittersweet in a way because it would have been cool to have that coverage and that help, those monies to help my son at an early age. Of course, he was older. Now he's he was kind of aging out of some of these autism centers because at maybe eight, nine years old, sometimes 11, 12, they age out. So he's 13 now and most of them, he aged out of it, so they, they won't accept kids that age. So that's another fight in, 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 for another day. But, yeah, it just, it just shows, for me personally, epidemiology, you know, showing the data. I always like, that's what I tell our staff, like hitting the head and the heart. That's, that's what we have to do. Like we have to make sure that they know the facts, but they also want to make sure that we're speaking to their heart. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. A little speechless, but I definitely agree with you. You hit my heart for sure. What an incredible story and what an incredible way to see the value of epidemiology, both personally and then applied to, you know, the work that you're doing. So really appreciate you sharing that. So I have one more question for you and then we can wrap up. I'm really enjoying our conversation and getting to know you and all the stuff that you're sharing is amazing. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a very diverse audience of listeners of the podcast. And I'd like to know if you have any bit of advice or tip that you'd like to share with someone 
who may be listening and also interested in working in, you know, maybe working with tribal communities? Any advice? So I always look at the communities as one big family. It's, it's, it's really about having a servant mentality or a servant's heart, a servant spirit. And the thing I'm struggling with these days, especially online, when I, I actually had to deactivate Facebook and I did that just because of so much negative things going on. And of course, there's the, the political ugliness going on, of course, all the time. And there's, there's always things out there that, so I had to deactivate it just to kind of get my bearings because at the time I'm going on two years sobriety. So in my own journey, I had to unplug and really just focus on improving myself, improving my health and well-being, improving mentally, being focused on my son and giving him resources. So a lot of the things that, that I see out there are really selfish instead of selfless. So if we have that selfless mentality, I think we can we can all get along better as a community and really take advantage of helping each other along, you know, as being a healthier, healthier community. But for, for the advice, I would just say be curious enough to find those resources and don't be scared to reach out to an organization like ours or you know, even your tribe. Like if, if you're a tribal member or even if you're non tribal, you know, just reach out and ask about these programs, ask about what's what's out there and resources. So it depends on what you're affected with. You know, that I think a lot of the things that are going on now with within our indigenous communities, I think fentanyl is a big one, the opioid epidemic is a big one. So it depends on what you're affected with. You could be like me. You could be a parent that's kind of trying to help their their son or daughter get better resources, you know, improve our situation within our family, improve his situation you know, as far as behavioral. So I work with the communities. I work with the school systems. I work with the behavioral health centers outside of this job. So that's kind of what I do outside of the creative work. So I'm always, always looking for resources. And I think that's what my best advice is to be curious and to make sure that you're reaching out because there's a lot of resources out there. We're just one of them, but we're, we're happy to, you know, share those resources. And if we don't have it, we'll point you in the right direction that to a tribe or an organization who does have those resources. And that's, I, I think that's one thing that we're, we're trying to do is simplify that all these resources that are in within our communities, like we're working with partners that to make sure that those are available and we're promoting those on our website. We're using our social media channels to make sure that, hey, these are our resources. If you need them right here, this is where they're at. So that, that would be my advice is to make sure that you're reaching out, you're asking questions. If you're curious enough to be, I guess, start a career in public health, man, I'll have to give a shout out to one of our programs. It's called Thesis. I forget the acronym, but it's it's Thesis. That, that's the acronym for the program, but they're starting a mentorship program for building curriculums for tribal health students that are wanting wanting to learn more about tribal health. And we're trying to promote that. That's that's kind of in the early stages, but it's it's a great creator to be in. It's it's very rewarding. You know, you get to learn about your people, you get to learn about the the situation within the tribal pub, public health realm, all the issues that are going on. I think also too, <laughs> shameless plug, there's our conference coming up, our Tribal Public Health Conference is in April. That'll be in Durant, Oklahoma, at Choctaw Nation Casino and Resort. And that's basically a stomping grounds for all of these leaders in tribal public health. That's all going to converge in, in three days to share all of these resources. I actually tipped off some of my family who who's in the health realm, it's counseling, therapies, psychologists. Man, there's there's just so many different people there that that you can kind of build off, learn from educational materials. There's trainings, great speakers. I think one of our speakers is Dr. Evan Adams, who's who was on the Smoke Signals movie, Thomas, but he's one of our keynotes. 
in any case, yeah, I'm kind of given a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's good, though. I actually am familiar with that conference. I had someone that was had submitted an abstract, and it was not accepted. But if it had been accepted, I was planning to attend to support her as well. Still haven't completely crossed it off because it's maybe doable. But that's, that's at the time we're recording this, the very beginning of February, it'll air. They won't have much time to actually plan for the conference, but we'll try to get a link in the show notes at any rate for people that may be interested. Thank you so much for taking time and sharing so much value on this episode. I've learned so much. I just really enjoyed hearing from you and, and your stories and responses. And I so admire all of the stuff that you're doing, both the creative space with your organization, the work that you do in the community, how you advocate for your son. Congratulations on two years sobriety. You're doing just amazing things all the way around. So I really applaud you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I feel like we can have this conversation for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did and found value in the advice and insights that Alex shared. I do encourage you to explore the Tribal Epidemiology Centers and specifically the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board in Oklahoma so that you can learn more about what Alex shared with us in this episode. There's also a tab on the website to learn more about internships and employment opportunities with the Tribal Epidemiology Centers. To find all of the links to their to their website and the other resources mentioned in our conversation, just visit the show notes page for this episode, which is episode 293. Go to phecpodcast.com and from there, navigate to episode 293 to find the show notes. One more thing before we go, please take a moment and share this episode with a friend. I'm sure you know at least one person who would be interested in hearing this conversation. If you're listening right now in one of the podcast apps, then it's pretty easy to share this episode through text or share it in a post on social media. But also at the bottom of the show notes page, you'll find social sharing links and buttons, which make it super easy to share this episode with your network. All right, everyone. Until next time, have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Epidemiology Conversations podcast. Visit phecpodcast.com to find the show notes for each episode and to learn how to work with me. 